Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti-fat world. I'm Sophia Apostle, a fat professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears. We will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against weight stigma, diet culture, fat phobia, ableism, racism, etc. You can get more Fat Joy goodness, including how you can support the podcast through my newsletter at fatjoy.substack.com. And for episode transcripts, book reviews, and show notes, head to the Fat Joy website at fatjoy.life. I am so glad you're here. Enjoy this episode. Hello, lovelies. Welcome back to the Fat Joy Podcast. I'm Sophia Apostle, and with me today is Michelle Osborne. Hi, Michelle. Hi, how are you? I'm so excited to talk to you. We've been planning this for quite some time, and we made it today. Yeah, and I, you know what? I so appreciate you being so patient because life. Life happens. Life. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was saying to you, and here's a little kind of like backdoor look at creating podcasts, is I record pretty far in advance because life, because my life, because guest life, like you just don't know. And I, I, I hate the thought of being like, oh my God, an episode's coming out this week and I don't have one. So I am months in advance so that we can life together. Look at you so organized. I love that. I wish I wasn't that organized and I am not. I'm not even gonna lie. I, I am. Oh, I get too stressed. I have to. It's a little, it's a, it might be a little compulsive, but it's like, oh, it's the only way I can function. Yeah. I'm learning to actually, my, my job is to actually become a little more, like a little less rigid. So I could probably learn from you in that respect. Well, you know, I wasn't always like, you know, I was a really rigid person. I'm a Virgo, right? So we like to plan, organize and keep things in order. And I used to get really anxious and stressed about that stuff until, you know, I turned 40 and I was like, I don't want to be like that anymore. I don't want to feel like I'm put in this box of always feeling like everything has to be perfectly organized and perfectly done. And I had to really practice letting go. It wasn't natural for me, not at all. Yeah, I get that. I'm a Virgo ascending, so I think that's where we 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 come by it honestly. And you know what? When I turned 40 is also when I became a stepmom to two preteens who are now teens, and that actually forced me to let go of some rigidity or especially around my space cuz suddenly we were all living together. <laughs> and it was like Oh, they don't want to line up the glasses with the handles all at the same 45 degree. What's happening? <laughs> well, you know, I could resonate with that so much because my partner moved in with me this past uh, May, June, and she really likes things orderly, clean and organized. And I had to have a conversation with her before she moved in to say, uh, you know, I'm not a hugely messy person by any means, but I do have a child. So you have to be able to let go that sometimes the living room is going to be a mess. And sometimes I'm going to be a rush in the morning and the kitchen is not going to be clean. You have to be able to be okay with that. And I know it's not going to be easy and it's not going to become natural right away. But I had to give her a heads up because I knew she was that person and, and, is it easy for her? Probably not, but she has really been able to kind of let go in that way because she knows that with a child, it, it, there's just no, you just can't be, there's just no way. Yeah. Well, and you got engaged. So congratulations. I did get engaged. I got engaged. We went traveling to Jamaica and, um, that's where my dad's side of the family is from. We're Jamaican on my dad's side. My mom's side is Canadian and it was, totally unexpected i guess sometimes you don't really expect it but you know and it, for her she said it just seemed like the right place and the right time she did not have a ring 
She literally bought the ring. They had these, you know, fancy jewelry stores on site when you go to these places. And I always wonder, I was like, do people really buy rings? And I was telling me, do people really buy rings? And we went in just to look at stuff and look at rings. And then I was trying on a ring and I'm like, and I started crying at this specific ring that I had never done before. And, and she said she knew then that she had to get it and then so she bought it but then she didn't want to wait to get it sized or anything so i think our second last night she, we went out to dinner we came back she sat on the bed and she started getting emotional and i'm like what is wrong with you <laughs> and she's an emotional person and then so she just popped the question and it was like the actual the perfect place to do it and for her, even, it was impromptu. It was totally impromptu for both of us. It was lovely. Wow. Oh, that's such a beautiful story. I love that you cried when you put on the ring. Yeah, I was like, you know, I. It's, they always say you're going to know. And the ring that I actually have, I, I would never have thought to pick it out ever. I would have like, I was like, oh, it's get, my ring wouldn't look like that or like that. And when I put it on, it just, I just started crying and I literally left the building because it was so, so overwhelming for me. So it was lovely. Oh, Michelle, congrats. That's just so, I love, I love that we get that story. Thank you. I've never told this story. I just said that I was engaged, but I've never told anybody how it's happened. So you are the first. Oh, exclusive to Fadjo listeners. Thank you. I I have tears in my eyes. I, I am like such a romantic at heart. And so I just love a love story. Also, Michelle, I just realized I no one knows who you are. So can you introduce yourself? We just started. We just jumped in, which is amazing. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What do you do in the world? Yeah, what do I do in the world? Well, my name is Michelle Osborne, aka Uncomfortable Bliss on all social media platforms. And essentially, I'm a communications professional. I, I worked in marketing for many, many years, and I moved to Quebec City after um, I met someone on vacation and fell in love. My marriage had ended, all of those different types of things, and I decided that I was going to open my own communication studio after a few years of being here because I did not speak the language. Um, I do speak French now. It, nobody knows Quebec City is, you know, 98% francophone and 2% anglophone, probably less than that. Um, and so I had to find a way to make a living for myself, even though my partner was very receptive to taking care of me. I was just that independent person that wanted to take care of myself. And I realized that because I had this challenge of not being fluent in French, I was going to have to figure out a way to do things my way. So I decided to open my own communication studio. Uh, the world is virtual now, so I could get clients from all around the world, essentially. And then, you know, after a few years of doing that, I decided to, to hop on TikTok. When the pandemic started and all hell broke loose and George Floyd incident happened, and that's kind of how I came to um start my own social media platform because before that i had you know a few friends on instagram and i was just posting random pictures of my life and then when i decided to get on tiktok and i had a kind of enough of what the world was at the time that's when things kind of really started for me on my platform so i've only been on social media really essentially for the last few years and I decided that I wanted to talk more about my experiences in my life and how I overcame certain things, how I reinvented my life, which is a big part of my platform, and how just sharing parts of myself, hoping to help other women, other people become the best versions of themselves. And I just do it my way. You know, there's a lot of people on social media who talk about, you know, body positivity and body liberation. And I think we all have something different to say. And so I just say it in my way that I think is authentically me. Yeah. And that's how I found you. I've been following you for quite some time and your videos, I find there's a substance to them that I really appreciate. There's a thoughtfulness. Oh my gosh, the one you posted of you and your beloved touching each other as like 
an example of what we don't see very often, which is two black women like being affectionate. It was so beautiful. It really moved me. I don't know what the response was like to that, but I was excited that knowing, because he posted that pretty recently and I was excited that we were going to be talking. So I could tell you that it was, I just, it shouldn't be audacious, but it is, you know? And I just, that's totally, I feel like that's your brand. Like you just step into your truth in a really big way. And I know that that must magnetize people to you because you're showing what we, what we should see more of, but we don't. And so you're contributing to seeing more of it. It was beautiful. I really appreciate that. You know, I think I think sometimes when I show my most vulnerable self and videos like that are quite vulnerable for me to show. In fact, I posted that. That was actually a repost that I posted on TikTok, not on Instagram so long ago. And I don't know what made me want to post it, but it was, oh no, it was International Lesbian Day or Happy Lesbian Day, something like that. And, <laughs> and, um, and I asked her, I always ask her before I film anything or repost anything. I said, do you mind if I read this on? And she's like, we did that, eh? And she was feeling really vulnerable about it too. She's just like, wow, that's kind of like, and I said, you know what? I just want to normalize queer people, queer people being affectionate just as much as straight people because when straight people do it it's not a big deal when you see a queer person do it it's like everybody's like did that really just happen so i wanted to really normalize it for that day and it was actually really a sincere moment it was when she did not live here actually and she used to go back and forth because she's originally from montreal and she used to be so sad when she was leaving and so um, we just ended up recording that moment of her getting ready to leave and, and, and that was it. But I really just want to, you know, you know, sometimes I like to say, I like to say, or show people things that people are afraid to show. So I'm going to show it for them because I'm sure there's a lot of people who feel the same way, but we all don't have the voice to do it or don't want to do it. And that's totally, completely okay. But I think when I started to, my social media platform a few years ago, um, the George Floyd incident really shook me to my core where I was really a conservative kind of quiet. Like I didn't want people to know what my opinion was because I was afraid of judgment. And at that point I was just like, I have so much to say and I'm just going to say it. And it will weed out the people who don't want it or who are not meant to be in my life. And the ones who are meant to be in my life will stay. And so that is kind of just how things have developed in my, in my life too, not just my platform in my life. And moments like that also, I find those vulnerable moments because as a Virgo, we don't like to be vulnerable. We always want to act like we have it together and we're strong and we don't need help. Um, that is something that I've worked on a lot over the last few years. And you have to when you're on social media uh, to really, I think, be your authentic self. And it's really cathartic, to be honest with you. A lot of the stuff I do, whether I'm and, you know, I think I did a post in the last couple of weeks where I showed my measurements. That was so liberating and cathartic for me because I didn't even know my measurements. I just know, you know, this is the size that usually fits me when I go to the store. And I think more people appreciate that than when I first started my social media platform where I had makeup on and I was dancing and there's nothing wrong with that. I'd still do that from time to time. But now I just like to talk like talk about my experiences and regardless as if I'm wearing makeup or not, that's kind of how my platform has evolved. Yeah. And it's brilliant. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned the one where you were being measured and showing the process. And I, were you wearing bra and underwear? I feel like you, yeah. you were less clothed. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it's so interesting because I've, I've done that on myself. And yet when I saw your video, I was like, Oh, I've never actually seen this done publicly before. It's one of those weird moments where it's like, why is this a hidden practice? I'm not like, am I, is there a shame around it? Is it like, we must keep this number secret? Is this like the diet culture bullshit? Like, but you just putting it out there was, I was like, oh yeah, this is not a big deal. You just use your numbers and it's like your body and it's all good. We can move forward. Like, yeah, I think you you have a real gift for doing that, Michelle. It's beautiful. Thank you. I think 
I think, I think, you know, women in particular, I'm sure it happens with everybody, uh, but we have so much shame around what sizes we are wearing. And, and, you know, people know I'm a large person. People know I have fat. So they know I'm not going to be in a size two. So I felt, and you know, it was kind of like twofold, right? Like um, I had recently signed to a modeling agency and they needed my measurements. And it actually took me a while to do my measurements, not because I didn't want to do them, just I just literally kept forgetting. And then I was like, this is a perfect time to to show people that your measurements are just numbers. And I'm going to give you my numbers now. Does that make you like me even less? Am I less successful? Am I going to lose my partner, my lover, because of what the measurements are? And to be honest, the partner that I have now is the first one, and I've been married before, is the first one where I actually felt 100% comfortable and free and letting her know what those numbers were. And I think I've hit it for a long time, even though I was a fat person, I am a fat person and my partners knew I was a fat person. Um, I still had shame around what the number was. And my, my current partner, which I think is amazing or interesting to me is, um, She's an athlete, um, prior athlete, and had always had partners who were athletes. So always had partners who had certain body types. And so for me to be able to just be free with her, knowing that that's what she was used to, was, um, I, I don't even know what the word is to say, but it was definitely freeing for me. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful which is the perfect segue into your relationship to the word fat. How, what role has this word played in your life? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's one thing I, I talk about on my platform and, and the thing is I never took pictures of myself as an adult. I don't have any. Um, I've had people send me ones randomly in the last couple of years because I said, I don't have any because I hated what I looked like so much uh, because I associated what I look like with the word fat. And as I look back, you know, I went through easily, you know, maybe to almost 20 years of being depressed about how I looked. And looking back at pictures, I was not fat. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard so many guests say that same thing. And same with me. I look back at pictures where I remember feeling hideous. And I was like, oh my God, I was probably a size 12. Like, I mean, it's ridiculous the perceptions that we have. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I was like a size seven, eight at my smallest. Uh, I was in the fitness industry. I was doing this and that. And people thought I had it all together. And I really, really struggled because I was doing everything I like, you know dieting like crazy fat burning drugs like crazy extra over exercising like crazy i literally um was trying to fix myself in order to feel like i was perfect that i could be the chosen one that i would fit in and it was all too much it was all too much so i did not have um uh, um I did not want to associate myself with the word fat. Now, as I'm grown into myself and I embrace who I am, knowing that I'm a work in progress, and I think everybody is, um, I just see fat as an adjective and I have no problem using it. I use it often on my platform and I think um, that too has also helped me to be more vulnerable, more... Uh, feel more free within myself because I'm just like, this is what it is. And, and my, my partner too, I, I thought, you know, when I first met her, I thought, how is she going to feel when I talk about this? You know, she knows what my body looks like, but how is she going to feel? And she feels so proud of me in every, in every way possible. So I never, I did not have a good relationship with the word fat. I hated being known as fat. If someone called me fat, I would be like, am I fat? Am I really fat? And now I'm just like, yeah, I am. And I don't know what else you want me to say. <laughs> and so that, those are all those pieces that come out when I'm being the most vulnerable 
I don't think my audience realizes how much I'm helping myself in the process as I show these parts of me. They think that I'm helping them when actually they're helping me too by allowing me to be vulnerable on this platform and being supportive and and really connecting with me and resonating with what I have to say because um, it, it goes, it really goes both ways. Yeah, that's beautiful. And isn't that the wonderful aspect of doing self-work is what we what we do, there's a reciprocity or an interplay that happens between, I feel this as a coach, like when I'm coaching someone, I'm also kind of getting coached, right? So like, yeah, like up-leveling is up-leveling, growth is growth, vulnerability is vulnerability, like it just begets more of it. And just if depending, like, even though you're the one making the video, that doesn't mean you're not getting a beautiful healing and a benefit from it too. Like, that's, that's amazing. I love that you just named that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think from day one, sharing my thoughts on the platform wasn't necessarily about, I'm going to tell you what I think. It was part of my healing journey to heal those parts of myself that I had not accepted yet that I was still really vulnerable with and perhaps hiding certain parts of me. So I didn't start off, although it seemed like I was totally amazing and comfortable and everything was, I did not start off that way. It was actually a, a process. In fact, um, I speak a lot on my platform now. When I first started, I hid behind, like I said, um, the outfits, the makeup. I never spoke probably for about two years on my platform, it was just words or music or dancing. And I didn't, and, and frankly, there was two reasons why that was. One, because I hate the sound of my voice. I was like, oh, every time I heard it. And then number two, I felt like I didn't know how, how to say what I wanted to say naturally. I felt like it was forced and like I was like trying to, until I just said, you know, you're not going to get comfortable with it, Michelle, until you just keep doing it. And it took me a long, long time to be comfortable to just be natural speaking. I think, I think maybe some people thought I was at the beginning, but I actually really wasn't. And um, those are all those little pieces of me when now I just speak to people like I'm speaking to my girlfriend or my friends. And I had to really kind of be like, Michelle, don't speak like you're trying to be the professional. Just speak naturally like it's your home girl and you're going to say whatever you want to say. And that really helped me. And I think um, I think people resonate with me just speaking more actually than dancing or showing clothes, which I have to say are still a lot of fun. But I have the most amount of joy when I just speak my mind about an issue. Well, it's so interesting. When I, one of the things that comes up a lot when I talk to people is this idea of visibility. And so you have a few identities, right? You're black, you're queer, and you're fat. So you, and there might be others that I don't know about, but you know, so you've got this intersectionality, and you're also really stepping into visibility on purpose. And I'm just, I'm curious about that journey as well. And how that played into the fact that it, and maybe there's not a connection, but it, I'm wondering if there's a connection with the fact that it took a couple of years for you to be comfortable speaking, for you to be seen in that way, for you to show up really open and raw with people. Because there's, there's a safety component, I think, too, with, with marginalizations. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I think, um, you know, when I first started the platform and um, I was named a body positive advocate and I never really saw myself that way at all. In fact, I just started calling myself a content creator this year, probably a few months ago. And people were like, Michelle, you're a content creator. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just someone who likes to be on and speak my mind and have fun. And it, I literally started to step into that only this year because I was like, okay, Michelle, I guess you are, you're doing a lot. You're doing a lot. Um, but I think, you know, when I first started, I was having a lot of fun and then I had labels put on me and I didn't really know who I was. 
And the body positive movement was actually really new to me. I had no idea. And I, people were like, what, what is this body positive movement thing? I'm just trying to do my thing and, and show people who I am and what I like. And now I'm at the point where um, visibility is absolutely more about my message than it is in terms of how I look to people online. I, I think I covered myself up so much before because I wasn't sure of myself. And every single year, month, day, um, I take off more and more and more of the layers. Like now my lot of things are so minimal because I just, I just feel like I can't be anything else but myself. And if I mask it with different things, um, I'm just not myself anymore. And so every year I take off, like if, if I could take off more hair, I would take off more hair because there's something about being at this age, I'm 49 now, and there's something about being at this age where you, you just feel like you can't possibly pretend one more day longer. Like you just can't, there's something inside you that just can't take it anymore. And so this is where I, I'm at in terms of visibility now. And so even on my platform, I still talk about body acceptance, body liberation, but I even more talk about um coming into yourself and owning your power and and really living your truth embracing who you are knowing that it, it's okay to change if you want to i'm an anti-diet person i am not against losing weight what i am against is losing weight for other people because i'm a big on bod bodily autonomy and so i think people need to do what they need to do for them but i will never tell anybody well you shouldn't lose weight because of the body positive movement. No, I think you should do what you need to do for you. My my challenge is when you're doing it for strangers on the internet because they told you that you look like this and now you're like, oh my gosh, I got to go run and do this because people are telling me I look like this or anything or anybody who does not add value to your life, right? I think one of the things that I really also try to stress is that we're all work in process. You know, life has its ebbs and flows. There is nuances to everything. So when people always want to think they need to look a certain way or be a certain way, it is like literally impossible. And this is why we drive ourselves nuts because we think there's a straight path and there isn't. And so I really encourage women, people to really look at themselves deep. And a lot of the times it has nothing to do with the outer shell. It has to do a lot with the inner shell. And so we look for stuff that fixes the outer shell thinking it's going to fix things and it rarely ever does. So I really talk more about that now on my platform than anything else. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you just said. And I'm also wondering how you feel about what the role of systemic, like the role that systemic oppression plays, because when you talked about taking off layers and getting kind of back to our true authentic selves, so many, I think so many of those layers are given to us by, you know, all the oppressions. Here's a racism layer. Here's an anti-fat layer. Here's a, you know, all these layers. And so they, how do I want to say this? They like, they impact the inside part of us, right? And then so as we take them off, it, like I find out when I work with people, like half of it is figuring out, well, okay, but who am I without those layers? Like there's a bit of an unknown, right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think I even said it today in my video now that I'm thinking about it. Um, someone was commenting about, uh, you know, if you just, you know, grew your hair and took out your nose ring and, and, and went to the gym, you know, you would find someone and life would be easier. And, and I just had to reply by saying, and, you know, I've realized that there's just internet trolls and it happens all the time and they might, the, the, it makes my content so easy. They don't realize how it makes my content. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is easy. I don't have to do all the answers. I'll just reply because it's so easy. Um, but I recognize that my being is political. 
I'm a fat black queer woman. Any, I that's why I call myself the tr- the quadruple threat because you know there's always going to be someone who's going to uh, not like make fun of me, judge me for any one of those four things, and I'm not going to bounce around in my life trying to figure out how I can change those things because for sure my skin color is not going to change. It's just not my queerness is not going to change. So. I, I, I am I going to bounce around and change those things for people in my life that don't even know me or like strangers that I don't exist. And so, you know, systemic oppression really takes a, a toll in terms of, you know, every day I feel like I'm fighting in some way. Hey there, Fat Joy listeners. Did you know there's a mental health practice in Canada that is specifically for fat folks? Tend and Cultivate Counseling was created by and for fat people. It's a place that offers non-stigmatizing fat-centric mental health care, whether you want to talk about your body or not. They specialize in body trust, self-compassion, body liberation, eating disorders, relationships, sex, pleasure, and trauma. So if you're looking for mental health care that understands the complexities of navigating life in a fat body, head to tendandcultivate.com slash fatjoy. Or you can give episode 57 of the Fat Joy podcast a listen to hear my interview with their founder, Don Sarah. My partner and I actually worked with Don and got some really helpful relationship support when we needed it. And good news, they see clients outside of Canada too. Fat Mental Health Matters and Tend and Cultivate Counseling is here to support you. Get the website link in this episode's show notes to tendandcultivate.com slash fatjoy and prioritize your mental health. Just to be myself and to normalize that everybody is different and and then it's okay. But I also realized that a lot of those people who who make comments like that, um, I tell, I was just talking to my partner about it earlier, those type of people are people who really have nothing to do. And I and I mean it like this. If you are a business person, you're gonna focus on your business. You're not gonna be on Instagram writing dirty messages. If you have a family to take care of with kids and you have work, do you think that that person who has things to do is on IG making? So I I know that there are people or younger kids or whoever who really just have nothing to do and think it's fun, but they're also great learning opportunities for me and for my audience when they do it. It makes my content so easy. (laughs) I just, I love, I love that so much. It's like, yeah, turning it into. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll learn a lesson. I'll learn um, something that will inspire someone to really look at themselves and know that these things are not a big deal, right? So yeah, it makes my, makes my job easier. With all this beautiful, inspirational content, normalizing content, what kind of messages do you get from people who are grateful for you putting it out? Like, what's what? What are those messages like? What's what do you know is the impact that you're having, Michelle? You know, there's times I have to stay on my platform. Like, content creators, we get really exhausted trying to. You know, if I go away on vacation, people are like, where's Michelle? Why didn't you post for two weeks? What's happening? Da, da, da. And I had to really um, be okay with taking breaks and stuff like that. And I say this because there's times where sometimes I feel like my message is getting lost in translation or what am I doing this all for? And I get exhausted and that's when I know I have to take a break. And then I get messages from people. I got a message uh, a couple of weeks ago from someone who said, um, I'm a therapist and I asked one of my clients to follow you. And um, she has come back to me, a changed woman. I have people say, you know, Michelle, I've struggled with my body image for so, so long. And watching you has gotten me through these last few months like you would not believe and I get those comments at least a few times a week that's when I know 
what I'm do I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because there's nothing else that I've ever done in the world. Even my communications, I love communications. I love working with clients, but I tell you, when I get those messages, it reminds me of why I'm here and why I'm doing what I need to be doing, especially at the times where I get exhausted because, you know, as someone who is, who's also a producer of content, we're on social media, you know this, all the time. And people who are not content producers, they can kind of shift off and do whatever and not go on. And, and you know, the, they have no connection to it. They're not making money. That It's not part of their business, whatever. And so sometimes for content creators, it could be mentally and physically exhausting where there's been times I could tell you in the last year where I was like, do I want to continue doing this? It's exhausting. And then I will get messages like the one I just told you about of someone who, you know, I had this girl said, you saved my life because I was almost there, Michelle. And so I just keep going because I know that there are people here Hear my messages, even though it's in the stratosphere of the internet and I don't know where they are. Those, those are really the things that keep me going, I have to say. Yeah, I totally agree. I knew when you shared that example, it brought tears to my eyes because that is that is so meaningful. Like you've you've shifted someone's way of being in the world. That's that's incredible. You know, I don't I, I'm, and I don't think they realize they've shifted my way of being world as well. There's that reciprocity again. Absolutely. A hundred and ten percent. I I don't look at what I'm doing my platform as a one way street. Um, it is definitely a two way street. Absolutely a thousand percent. And I I feel like this is this is how humans are meant to live in reciprocity with each other, in energy exchanges, not extractive late stage capitalism. Um, and- Oh, we're right, yeah. Yeah. I think that's another reason why, you know, when people, when I get these comments from people who have nothing important to say except what they think of how a woman should look or how someone should be, um, I think that, it it reminds me how much work still needs to be done. I, I'm not sure, not sure in my lifetime, you know, there, I don't think there's going to be an end to it. Um, and I also think that, you know, I was thinking the other day, of, you know, how this body liberation movement has been so commercialized and capitalized on and, um, and how, you know, voluptuous was in and now it's not in. Now we got to go back to the really, really thin. And, and I, and I was thinking to myself and I decided to create a video about it, about beauty standards change all the time. Are you going to keep changing with them? Is that how we're going to spend our life every year, every six months going from thin to this and then short hair to long hair and lighter skin to darker skin and makeup and no makeup? How about you just do you? Because all of that is a little bit too much work for me. How are we supposed to say this is what beauty standard is when it changes literally all the time? Yeah. Yeah. I I really resonated when you said, you know, as you got older and into your 40s, that's when you kind of start giving zero fucks, which is one of your one of your taglines. And I agree. It was really, yeah, late 30s, but it's definitely 40s when I was like, I'm just done with not being exactly who I want to be, saying exactly who I want, what I want to say. And it, there were consequences, you know, there are a lot of my family members I don't really have a close relationship with anymore. There are friends that have gotten distanced. But then there's others who have gotten a lot closer and I feel more free than I ever have before. And what I think about all the time, Michelle, is like, why is, I don't want this to happen for the next generation in their 40s. How do we get this happening in like the teens? the twenties, the toddler years. Like, how do we, like, we need to like back this up because I hear it all the time from women in their forties. And I'm like, yay. And God, who could I have been if this happened in my twenties? You know, I would have had an extra 20 years of full Sophia, full liberation. 
So it's always still a work in progress, but like so less encumbered by all the shoulds and expectations that I believed I was supposed to follow. Yeah. And I, my God, I wish I had the answer to that. And I, I think it's, and it's hard to answer because I think it's dependent on a couple of things. What, who, who, who brought you up? Who raised you? And ha- that impact on your self-esteem and what you think about yourself. I am, I, I feel so lucky to have my daughter at the age that I had her. I had her at 42. She's six turning seven now. And because if I had her in my twenties or my thirties, I don't think I, I, I would have the impact as I do have her on today. What does that mean? It means I talk to her regularly about being herself. I talk to her regularly about it's okay to be vulnerable. I make sure that she knows that kind is cool and that, you know, regardless of who she, who she talks to is ever, we are all the same. I am very intentional about teaching her things so she is a, a, an asset to society in a kind and loving way. And, you know, there's times I see her going around the house telling, just singing about how much she loves her body. I'm very conscious with that. I, it's not something that I just hope she gets. I'm actually really conscious about it because I want this space, this home, wherever she is with me to be her safe space knowing that as she grows up, the world is already going to be challenging. She's already going to get these messages from friends or whoever. So all I can do as a mom and as a parent is is make her feel that um, she's in a safe space where she's always going to feel loved and herself and she can be herself and she can take up space and all of those different types of things. So I think it really depends on how you were brought up and who is bringing you up. And if, if, you know, that's why I tell people, women all the time, watch how you speak to yourself in front of children, because you think they can't hear you or see you and they can, they really, really can. I think that's number one. And I think number two, this world is so effed up that you just can't see it in your 20s. I think 20s is is for self-discovery and screwing up and partying and trying to figure yourself out. That's what it was for me. It was I would never want to go back to my 20s if you paid me nor my 30s. And so those two decades were tough. They were tough. And it wasn't until um, I, I, my marriage ended at a probably, I think it was around 38, my marriage ended that I decided that there was going to be no more, that I was going to do exactly what I wanted to do, say exactly what I wanted to say. And essentially that was the beginning of reinventing myself, you know, doing things on my own, not feeling like there has to be someone there to do things with. Um, We talked earlier about letting go a lot more. I was so stuffy and conservative. And when I decided I was going to be the new Virgo and just let it go, let me tell you, I let it go in every way in my personal life and sexually and everything I did. I just went a 360 total opposite because I realized that I was still stuck on trying to be something for someone and and hoping that people don't judge me. And then I was like, if you judge me, well, then there's nothing I can do because I did not want to leave this planet with regret, meaning not doing things that I wanted to do just because I was worried about someone else's opinion. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like you kind of just answered my question, which is everybody do your own work so that we can raise the next generation. <laughs> really, and, and that's really it because I would love to say that there is a solution or a formula and I don't think there is. I think everyone has to do their own work to make sure that the next generation um, doesn't get all the crap that we got like in the night. Like, you know, I look at all the shows they had on The Biggest Loser and talking about the like, honestly, no wonder why we're all effed up here because we had all of these images of how you're supposed to look and, you know, just exercise for 10 hours a day and barely eat and you'll be thin and yay, you'll win the biggest prize on TV. All of these things that have effed us all up. Um, and, you know, I, I make sure I let my daughter 
she choose how she wants to eat. If she doesn't want to eat a lot on her plate, she doesn't. If she wants to eat more in one second, I give her seconds. You know, I think that balance is amazing in life. And so I, I never say to her, no, that's not good for you. We're not going to eat that today. She knows how to balance because I've started her from the womb to see, yeah, you can have some chocolate. Why not? That's not a big deal. You can also have vegetables. Those are great for you too. And I'm, and I'm really intentional about it, actually, maybe too much so. But I, I just think this world is so effed up and I want to at least give her a foundation of where she knows that it's okay to be herself. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And you're also helping brands do really socially conscious work too. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that work? Like, why does, why does it matter? Why, why, why do we need to do it? (laughs) Well, I think, you know what, the reason why I started my communications business in that way, and, and, you know, there's a lot of communications consultants and businesses who serve everybody. I decided to serve this, this, a specific community, which are marginalized women um, who who, um, marginalized people who want to build socially conscious brands, because I found that, you know, a lot of people that I was talking to about um, when they wanted to start a business and they didn't know how, they had no communication plan, they didn't know what a communication, communication plan was and do I need one? Like, what is all of this? What is branding? I like the color blue. Shouldn't I use blue? All of those different types of things that they were trying to be someone else to fit in. And I said, actually, you should be and say your message just as you want to because there are people who need you just as you are because they felt like, okay, you know, even though they had never worn a suit jacket in their life, they felt in order to be taken seriously, they had to wear the suit jacket. And I said, actually, you don't. So my job as a person, um, the quadruple threat of being fat and black and a woman and uh, queer, I felt that I really wanted to contribute to the community in a way to show people that they can still be exactly who they are and be successful at whatever they're trying to do. Because a lot of them were hiding because they felt that if people know I'm gay, if people see me like in my natural state, they're not going to want the product or the service that I have. And I say, actually, they do. You just don't know how to be able to deliver it. And that's why um, people, that's what people hired me for. Oh, that's so great. I love that because I imagine (laughs) these are the brands that stand out, right? And that people are drawn to. Absolutely. I don't think people realize, I'll tell you something, when I first started thinking about, well, there wasn't even really social, it was more blogging, right? People were doing blogs. And I had a friend of mine, she was a, she was a blogger and I was so fascinated by it. And I said, I would like to start blogging. And she actually helped me set up a first blog, um, many, many years ago. Um, and she set it up, but it looked like her. And you know, at the beginning, you're really excited about it. You start, And then after a few months, it just fizzled off. And I realized that I was trying to do what she was doing or that everybody else was doing or look like everybody else because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. And that's why I didn't get back into social media years later because, um, you know, am I supposed to be doing this? Am I supposed to be doing fashion too? Am I supposed to be doing this? Well, they're doing that, but maybe that's what people want to see. And then my platform actually really took off when I did exactly what I felt like doing and didn't worry about what everybody was doing. When I started saying what I felt like saying and didn't worry about what everybody else was saying. And that is what I tell my clients. There are people out there who need your voice more than you know, or who resonate with you more than you know. There's a lot of people who are all doing the same thing. But if you are just I sound so, you know, maybe corny or cliche to say, if you really just hone into who you are and do it the way you want to do it, that is exactly when people buy from you and connect with you even more. And I I stand by that. I agree. I agree. It's so interesting because people listening regularly would have heard this story, but I started this podcast out of rage because I was just filled with rage. And I was like, 
I'm angry. I kind of hate everything right now. So let me talk about it publicly because that's what I do. That's my strength. And it's been so, and I'll call it joy though, because that's kind of what I'm seeking. So we're going to have both joy and rage. And it's been so interesting to get, to have people respond because the podcast has gotten beautifully popular, uh, which I'm very grateful for to everyone listening for. And a lot of the comments are like, I, you're you're saying the anger in a way that is what I'm thinking. And it's like, right. Yeah, just being able to fully be who we are takes so much courage, so much unlearning, and it's worth it, right? Like it's just so worth it. And I feel like that's the journey for so many people, probably who listen to this podcast, probably who are following you, is that we're inspired by other people's authenticity and vulnerability. And it, it, it like, again, reciprocity. When I watch your videos, I feel empowered to be even more raw, even more vulnerable. And yeah, and it's just like, that's that's what I want to be surrounded by now. You know, I want the unique specialness of every person to shine because that's what then inspires my unique specialness to shine. And it's totally different from theirs, but that's on purpose. We don't want to all be the same. Absolutely. And I love, I love what you just said. And I think, you know, as a plus size content creator, you can feel, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? have this feeling of you're supposed to be creating a certain type of content, i.e., uh, for example, um, fashion content for plus size creators, because we find it so difficult to find clothes to fit us and where are we shopping and what looks good and all that kind of thing. And I love fashion creators. I I love watching it because half the time that's where I got myself. I'm like, girl, where did you get those pair of pants? Let me go get them, right? Um, and a lot of people tell me, I shouldn't say a lot of people. Some people said, you know, maybe you should become a fashion blogger. I'm like, I don't care about fashion. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I love it. I love watching people. Um, it's a lot of work to have to go to stores all the time and buy clothes and show them what I'm wearing and have it in my closet. And, and I just think to myself, I don't mind. Like, for example, this season, I bought a few things that I will probably show and say, hey, if you guys want to go buy this, go buy it. It's great. But to have to do it all the time, that's a special person. And there are people for that. And it's great. And sometimes when you're a plus size content creator or, or content creator in general, you feel like, uh, because women, especially, we love to see clothes. You feel like maybe I should be doing that too. Am I going to be more successful? And I just really had to say, you know what? I just am going to show uh, authentically what I love. And sometimes if it's fashion, it's going to be fashion. It won't always be fashion because it's just not me. I just would rather talk about issues that I am passionate about and share my opinions and thoughts about that. That's what I prefer to do. In fact, um, I was talking to my partner this year and, and I think people don't realize, well, first of all, I find also that sometimes people want you to stay what you're doing. They don't want you to change. They want you to do this kind of content. And if, if you go to any other type of content, they're just like, why is she going there? Like I came here for this. And that was actually was hard for me to deal with because I found that almost every year there was a shift in me. I was changing. Right. And, and it hit me hard actually this year where I was just like, I don't feel connected to certain type of content anymore. And I, and I just want to speak more like that's, that's what I've been thinking about all year. I just want to speak more or express more. And, and so my priorities now have been thinking, where can I speak more? Where can I go to conferences more and speak my mind more? And like, and so I've actually put a lot, I'm actually speaking at a mom conference in a, in a week, actually, in Ontario, uh, where I talk about reinventing yourself and setting boundaries and prioritizing and giving zero fucks and still being a good mom. Because as moms, we always, we're always giving to other people. There's this mom guilt that we can't do stuff for ourselves. And so, um, I, I like, I could speak on stage all day and just chat about it. So, you know, but last year that wasn't that, two years ago, that wasn't necessarily in my mindset. I was thinking about something else. 
But it, sometimes it's, it's hard for your audience to accept that you evolve too. Boy, like, I, I'm definitely not the same that I was when I first started this platform four years ago. And we just have to evolve or are we growing? No. Yeah. And but again, what I hear in that too, if we think about reciprocity is like, we also have to give people space to evolve and that gets to be okay too. Like that's not fair of us to put our expectations that someone stays the same. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I really get that. I guess that, you know, sometimes my content might not be for certain people anymore. People join me for one thing. And then if it shifts and they're like, mm, you know, that's not my kind of content. I'm okay with that because guess what? There's certain people that I follow for certain type of content. And then if after, you know, six months, I don't find their content resonates with me, then I don't follow the M anymore. So I never get upset when I see people come and go because I understand that maybe they've gotten what they needed and they've moved on or my content is no longer for them. And that was something that I also had to learn um early on in this game and really be okay with because you know i on uh, especially on tiktok and and instagram is a beast too i never thought i would even have close to um and i don't think i have as many followers as a lot of people do but i never even thought i would have a thousand followers much less eighteen thousand followers and so um people really need to know that we're we're just human on the other side of the street too i had this person saying well people always think i'm american and i'm like what is it about that i'm american and they say well most stars are american and i'm like you don't think i'm a star i got a kia i am definitely not a star okay i'm very grateful for my car awesome it's great but yeah, we always have to give people that space to evolve to. And sometimes it's hard for the audience, especially when they follow you for a certain type of content. But I've had to, le I've learned to let that go and learn to be okay that people will come and go in your life, regardless of what it looks like. I agree. Yeah. I feel like when I was really stepping into my own um, self and experiencing the consequences of doing that, I just, I really kept, I would say over and over, I wrote, I literally had it written on a post it and attached to my my computer monitor where I would see it every day, which was, I am not for everyone. And that's okay. But my people, oh God, I was, I've, I'm like a recovering people pleaser. That was very hard for my people pleaser self. So I am not for everyone and that gets to be okay. In fact, there was a really funny YouTube comment recently on the episode I did with Martinez Evans, who has founded the Slow AF Run Club. And the person was like, yeah, it was like, Martinez is amazing. He's so positive. I'm very worried about the host, though. She seems really focused on the negative, and I hope she gets help. And it's like, <laughs> I am not for everyone, and that's okay. <laughs> and I think, you know what? I love that you said that because I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. with. They, they try to be for everybody. So if they really just recognize that this is not what we are here for to to please everybody and to be liked by everybody, which is hard for and it was hard for me for many, many, many years. I wanted everyone to like me, to think I was attractive, to think I was nice, to think I was funny until I realized pleasing everyone is an absolute impossible feat because I was trying to please everybody, but I myself was miserable. I think a lot of it to do for myself. Right. And I found that I got so disconnected from what does even please me. I had to do like a whole thing where I spent a year doing monthly desire days because I had forgotten what do I even desire? Like what is what is my dream? What do I desire? What do I want in this moment? I'd gotten so like disassociated from my own sense of what I wanted. Oh, I love that desire day. Oh, I love a desire day. Yeah. And I literally just get really present. And it, sometimes it's a couple of hours and I'll set a timer. I love when it's a full day. And I literally am just like, okay, what do I, the full self, want to do in this moment? And it might be like, don't do anything. Look out the window. Okay. I'll do that for a bit. And I'll be like, okay, what do I want to do now? Oh, maybe I want a nap. Okay. Maybe I want to walk. Maybe I want to eat. Maybe I want to watch TV. Like, maybe I want to go on a little road trip. Like, it really is like just building what I found was when I started like 
not judge it. And the whole rule is no judgment. Like you just do what you desire. And then you kind of like retrain yourself to be connected to it. It shifted so much for me. I, and now I'm very clear in most moments exactly what I want, which is such a gift. I'm totally going to steal it from you. I'm just take it, you. take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of, and I don't mean that, that my, I'm going to change my platform to say that, but you know, this I think is something that moms really need to hear at the mom conference is do a desire day. What do you desire? Because they, they empty their cup and everybody else's cup, but they forgot, to, they forget to do theirs because they've lost themselves a lot in parenthood or motherhood. And sometimes they don't even know what they desire anymore because they've been giving to everybody else. So I'm going to mention that. I'm going to say, you talk to me about that because I think it's really, actually really important for them to, to recognize. Yeah, please. You're welcome to it. Yeah. And I think I started there and I do this a lot with clients too, is it's very hard. I was getting, I was asking questions like, well, what's my purpose? What's my identity? Those were too lofty. I was like, I don't even know what I want to do in this moment. How can I figure out what my life purpose is? You know? So yeah, so it was like a, a lower hanging fruit way of starting to walk towards a connection to that deeper desire, longing, craving, dreaming. So take it, take it, use it. I want, I, the more people that are connected to their actual authentic desires, the better a world's going to be. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Michelle, let's talk about joy. What is your relationship to joy? What do you think about joy? How do you connect to it? What do I think about joy? You know, my relationship to joy has definitely changed from when I was younger to now. Joy when I was younger was, was being like, it was being at the hottest party. It was looking a certain way. Joy now for me is peace. <laughs> peace in the most. <laughs> I don't even know how to say, it. you know, I find the most joy when I am doing what I want to do and being at peace with it. And um, I really didn't think that I would get here because I was so much of a people pleaser. I was so worried about judgment. And I feel like it's hard to feel joy when you're so, when you're concentrating on what someone, somebody else's need. And so my relationship to joy now is that if it does not fill me up in some way, then I, can't, I don't make room for it in my life. And, you know, people, you know, mistaken, you know, when I say, you know, I, I, I don't give zero fucks. People are like, oh my God, Michelle, you don't care about anything. Of course I care about things, right? What I don't care about is that if you're not adding value to my life, if you're a stranger that doesn't know anything about me and you have an opinion, those are the things I don't care about, right? But of course I care about a great relationship with my partner and my daughter and, and, and at times what they think about me. But I don't care if you don't like my hair or not. Like it's, you know, just certain things like that. But my relationship with joy is so filled with really honing into my authentic self. That's all it's about right now in my life and feeling at peace with it because, and because of that, my relationship with my child and with my partner um, is so different than what it was when I, when I was married and I was raising a child with my other partner. Um, that was her child. Actually, it wasn't mine, but the peace that, because I'm at this space of peace, it's a totally different type of relationship. And not only that, I think um, I think I've changed in terms of how I love and how I have relationships with people that bring me joy. For a great example, you know, when I was with relationships with other people, I didn't realize or I didn't know how people wanted to be loved. I assumed, you know. I'm going to give you a gift. You must know I love you. I'm doing this for you. You must know I love you. But one of the things that I've done in this current relationship um, that I'm in is we intentionally sit down and ask each other, what is your love language? How do you like to be loved? Because I always assumed from people it was 
they love they they like to be loved how I like to be loved. Until I realized, oh my God, you don't like to be loved how I like to be loved. Why not? I don't understand. Um, that has totally changed my life. Actually, I would say in terms of my relationship with my partner. Now I know that, oh, she likes to be loved this way. My old partners, they, I would love them that way. And they'd be like, but I don't like to be loved that way. And I, and I never understood it. So we're really intentional about that. And of course, with my, my daughter, I'm really intentional about making space and paying attention, um, as well as with my partner when, um, my life is so crazy and busy where I used to be like, well, I have to work. I can't really talk to you. I can't really do this. And now I'm really intentional, intentional about prioritizing time and space with them, with them knowing that I also need to prioritize time and space for myself. And so those were all of the things that were, I feel the most joy in knowing that I'm really intentional with everything I do now. Life isn't, isn't happening to me. I'm really in control of it now, whereas I would just let it happen. But um, everything I'm, I'm more intentional about in my life, and that's what brings me joy. Oh, that's beautiful, Michelle. This has been such an incredible conversation, Michelle. You are meant to be a speaker. You're brilliant. And I just, I, I have so many notes from what we talked about, and I'm, yeah, I'm just really filled with gratitude for this conversation. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you. Like this is, I, I could chat forever. This is like, honestly, I'm going to put that into the universe. You are meant to be a speaker. I'm going to put that into the universe. I'm a big manifester. Okay. A big manifester. And so, um, I put into the universe that, um, hopefully that's where my career takes me in terms of doing a lot more speaking and talking to people like you who are just so beautiful and wonderful and you fill my heart today. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about, expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. For this episode with Michelle, I'm reading a poem by Ada Limon called Lover. Michelle shared some of her love story with us, and I'm always struck by how her online content feels so deeply rooted in love. So here's Lover by Ada Lemon. Easy light storms in through the window, soft edges of the world smudged by mist, a squirrel's nest rigged high in the maple. I've got a bone to pick with whomever is in charge. All year I've said, you know what's funny? And then nothing, nothing is funny, which makes me laugh in an oblivion is coming sort of way. A friend writes the word lover in a note, and I am strangely excited for the word lover to come back. Come back, lover. Come back to the five and dime. I could squeal with the idea of blissful release. Oh, lover, what a word. What a world. This gray waiting. In me, a need to nestle deep into the safekeeping of sky. I am too used to nostalgia now, a sweet escape of age, centuries of pleasure before us and after us, still right now, a softness like the warm, worn fabric of a nightshirt. And what I do not say is, I trust the world to come back. Return like a word, long forgotten and maligned for its gross tenderness, a joke told in a sunbeam, the world walking in, ready to be ravaged, open for business. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life on YouTube at youtube.com slash at fatjoy and on Substack at fatjoy.substack.com. 
And please do check out the episode notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly fat joy day. And we'll talk again soon.